Good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce our guest today. Um, Al Gantz, he's going to talk about coffee. And I'll do a short introduction. And is Al, are you unmuted? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Uh, Al is a uh, Summit Old Guard member. Al, how long have you been a member? Oh, about uh, two years now. Okay, great. And how old are you? Well, I'm approaching the big, uh, big figure of 9-0. 9-0, 90 years old. Al, the next council meeting, I'm gonna propose that anybody who reaches 90 doesn't have to pay dues. How would you like that? Oh, I, that, that would be great. Okay, so you gotta give the 30 bucks to charity though. Mm. All right? Okay. Al lives in New Providence. Uh, he attended uh, the following universities, Molenberg, Iona, and he got his PhD in chemistry at Polytech Institute, New Jersey. Uh, he worked for uh, General Foods as a physical chemist. And during my conversation, I found out that he retired from General Foods got his teaching certificate and taught chemistry at Livingston High School. So Al, how was it being a retired PhD in chemistry teaching high school in Livingston? Well, it was a, it was, it was a great experience that I, I had always looked for the opportunity to uh, end my career as a teacher. And um, uh, when um, General Foods was purchased by uh, Philip Morris, I took the, uh, the, the buyout and became a, a teacher. And I uh, taught at Livingston High School for about 13 years. I taught honors and AP chemistry. That's wonderful. I, we had a short conversation and I revealed that chemistry wasn't my favorite subject in high school, but I, I hang out with a lot of engineers and chemists and I, I try to understand. Okay, so Al, uh, you're on. Okay, well, you, you, the, the slide before you, you can see, for example, in other words, it shows the uh, three pitches there. The one in the upper right-hand corner, uh, you, you see the, uh, the, the coffee beans, they're red. Uh, coffee beans grow like a, you know, a chestnut uh, in that they have an outer shell, and then the nut is on the inside. In the, in the case of coffee, we call it, in other words, a bean. In the case of chestnuts, we call it a nut, so what's on the inside. Um, the, um, now when you want to prepare coffee, you, you, you have to do, you know, what you, you take those beans that are there and you have to roast them. Um, and then you, in other words, after you roast them, then you pour, pour uh, hot water over them. Uh, and they, uh, uh, elicit, you know, the words, uh, the, uh, uh, the coffee brew, uh, that, that, that comes out. Uh, and so that's how you make your cup of coffee. Uh, there are different types, of course. Uh, now, the, the uh, coffee that's in, the, in those two uh, bowls right there is uh, Arabica coffee, which comes from uh, uh, the Central America, and uh, Robusta coffee, which comes from Africa. Um, okay, now coffee beans, in other words, uh, can be uh, vary from green to, uh, to bright red. Uh, it is picked, it's uh, processed and dried. Uh, that means taking that outer shell off, it comes off very easily. Uh, then you uh, then, then you dry the coffee beans usually in the sun, uh, and then you uh, you roast it and then you uh, you uh, you grind it up uh, to a, uh, to a particular part of si particle size depending on the the, the, uh, the brewer you're going to use, and then you brew, brew your coffee, uh, and that's what we usually drink uh, most of the time in the morning. Uh, the um, can I have the next slide, please? The, you know, this shows, the, in other words, the, uh, the plants that, in other words, uh, uh, of the coffee beans. You can see, for example, in other words, it grows on, in other words, uh, 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 bushes. Um, and uh, you can see that um, the, um, uh, it's, uh, it actually grows, in other words, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a hot climate. In other words, on the, in, uh, right on the equator, but, uh, but at, a, at an elevated in the mountains of... Uh, Colombia and the Indian Mountains of Brazil uh, is where the coffee beans grow best. Uh, so that, 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 the diagram shows the, uh, 
uh, the coffee beans are being uh, uh, on, on the bush there in the upper right hand corner. You can see they're, um, they're green. Uh, and and on, the on the left of that figure, you can see, in other words, it goes on a, like a bush or a short, a short tree. Uh, and uh, then, they're, then they're picked. And, and after you, um, uh, in, the, in the lower right hand corner, you can see, for example, that, in other words, the beans that came out of, uh, out of, out of, out of those, uh, those bushes there. So um, it's a uh, it's a technique that is uh, used, in other words, to uh, to grow coffee beans. Uh, and can I have the next slide, please? This slide shows, in other words, that they, in other words, uh, uh, the first time coffee appeared on the scene was back in the 15th century. Um, the earliest source of uh, coffee was in the Ethiopian highland, highlands. That's in Africa. Um, the, uh, in, in, in the 16th century, in other words, the Middle East and Africa, in other words, uh, uh, were also sources of, uh, of, of coffee. Today, there are about approximately 70 countries that grow um, uh, coffee. It's grown in the equatorial regions of, uh, of the Americas, in Southeast Asia, India, and Africa. Um, the... Um, um, <clears throat> now, the... Um, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see, for example, there's a, uh, a figure of uh, the um, uh, 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 pictures of, you know, that shows you, for example, the, this is uh, the coffee production in 2018. You can see Brazil is away, high on the list. In other words, they have, in other words, uh, are growing in excess of uh, 3,000, uh, three, uh, 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 three and a half million tons of, uh, of, of coffee. Um, they, they, therefore, they, they actually produce, in other words, a third of the coffee that is produced in the world. Um, now, the other producers that are important to us are Colombia. Colombia and Honduras are both Central American countries, and they, uh, and they, 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 they grow over, over um, uh, one, uh, one million tons of, of, of coffee. And then the other one that's important to us is Ethiopia. The three important uh, uh, coffees that are used in, uh, are the uh, Brazilian coffee, the Colombian coffee, and the uh, uh, Robusta coffee, which comes from Ethiopia. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Um, this slide shows you the, uh, the coffee roasting. When you, uh, you take those green beans and you go to roast them, in other words, that converts the chemical compounds that are in the coffee and there are over 360 of them uh, into um, uh, uh, aldehydes and ketones. Now, these aldehydes and ketones are the uh, are the uh, aroma and, and, and flavor components, in other words, of that coffee. Um, yeah. The uh, but then now now those, whereas those those green beans you you obtain from the uh, from the trees, in other words, we're uh, we're very stable, having only about 10 percent moisture. Um, and uh, the roasting process converts these, these things to aldehydes and ketones. These, these, these are not very stable. So if you're going to do any chemical processing of, of coffee beans, like decaffeination, uh, for example, uh, you want to work with the green beans rather than the, uh, uh, than, than the, uh, the roasted coffee, because the aldehydes and ketones are relatively unstable compounds uh, that give off their, their aroma and, and flavor to the coffee. OK, let's look at the next slide. It shows a, um, uh, a, a, a can of uh, Macintosh coffee. You know, I mean, that's, you know, I, I work for General Foods. So that's what my presentation here today is going to be mostly with uh, General Foods products. Um, the, um, uh, and uh, so I'm going I'm I'm to talk now, in other words, a little bit about decaffeination, how you go about doing, uh, doing uh, coffee decaffeination so you get a better feel for what's involved in, in, in decaffeinated coffee. Now the uh, uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to um, uh, uh, but but first let me just say that there are basically uh, I I said the three major types of uh, coffee are uh, Colombian, uh, or Brazilian, and um, uh, robusta coffee. Um, the um, just to give you an idea, in other words, coffee is the most po uh, popular drink outside of water. Um, and there are over 400 billion cups consumed annually. Uh, on a per capita basis, uh, Finland is the biggest consumer of coffee at 12 kilograms uh, uh, per person per year. 
Um, the uh, United States is 25th on that list. Uh, we're, we're down to four kilograms uh, per person per, uh, 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 per year. So you can see, for example, in other words, coffee is, in other words, is a, a very, very important product in, internationally. Um, and uh, the, um, when I worked at General Foods Corporation, in other words, General Foods uh, and, and lots of other coffee manufacturers, they, in other words, do the same thing that GF does. Uh, they, uh, are, uh, General Foods has 10 years of green beans stored in caves in Iowa. Uh, so if, they, if, the, if the coffee market cannot supply uh, coffee in a given year, they have a supply <clears throat> to be able to continue, continue to make, make, the, make the, co the coffees, uh, which, is, which is very important. The, um, uh, during the 70s and 80s, I worked at General Foods Corporation in a group who, uh, their whose main function was to look for new solvents for decaffeination. Um, <clears throat> the, um, now, <clears throat> originally, in other words, General Foods used the uh, 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 trichloroethylene uh, in the decaffeination process, but that was shown to be uh, carcinogenic. And now the FDA has a group called, uh, has a specification called GRA the GRASS list. The GRASS list stands for Generally Recognized as Safe. Uh, so, so if compound if, if, if solvents are on that list, then they're then, then they're okay for foods, uh, the baby use for foods. If they're not on that list, then in other words, you know, they're carcinogenic. Uh, then uh, um, trichloroethylene is not on that list, but methylene chloride is. So therefore, uh, companies have swi uh, switched to uh, methylene chloride in the decaffeination of coffee. Uh, and you'll see in another one I described the decaffeination process. The uh, uh, where that uh, that solvent comes in uh, for the decaffeination. Now, the in the GF method for decaffeinating coffee, uh, I'm going to describe. Do we need the uh, next slide? Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, in the GF method for decaffeinating coffee, we uh, this was originally developed by uh, two engineers at General Foods Corporation. They used the Berry and Walters patent of 1947. Now, you know, uh, I'm sure you know that patents last for about 20 years. Uh, so um, uh, 20 years, in other words, you know, 47 takes up to 67. So obviously anyone can use this patent today. And a lot do use the GF method, but not everybody. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the process. So I'm going to describe this process you know, almost like a lab experiment. So we will start off with, in other words, with um, a beaker. Uh, and uh, say a three liter beaker. Uh, and then we're gonna put into it, uh, in other words, 500 milliliters of water. Uh, and uh, then in that water, we're gonna take some uh, half a pound of green beans. And then we'll put a, a stir in there and we'll stir that up for maybe about 15, 20 minutes. Now, at, that, at the end of that time, now what's happened is the fact that uh, compounds that are inside the coffee and, uh, and there are approximately uh, 360 compounds, in, uh, uh, different chemical compounds in, in green beans, uh, are gonna, are gonna, we're going to come out and go into that water phase. Uh, and uh, eventually an equilibrium is going to be established um, where, the, where the, the maximum amount of uh, co uh, coffee can go from the, from the green bean to the, uh, to the water phase. Uh, and at the end of the, the, let's say the, 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 half, the half hour or 15, 20 minutes that we've mixed it, uh, we, we, we re, we're assuming that we reach equilibrium. So therefore, now the, uh, if we filter that solution and then take the, those, uh, the, the remains of those green beans uh, and throw them away, we now have a solution which represents, the, in other words, the equal, e, e, equilibrium uh, concentration of, uh, of green beans in, the, in, in, in that coffee bean that are now in that water phase. Um, so therefore, the, um, uh, <clears throat> we now, in other, in other words, uh, uh, and that, that involves every chemical compound that was in, inside that green bean, including the caffeine uh, that's, come out, that's come out into that water phase. Um, now the um, uh, uh, <clears throat> the thing is, that, in other words, we need to look for a solvent. Uh, in other words, that can uh, remove that caffeine. Uh, 
So therefore, in other words, and the best solvents are, are of course, as I said before, they are the chlorine and hydrocarbons. We use methylene chloride. Um, and we're gonna use a, um, um, a, a device here, in other words, to, in order to do the extraction, if you um, call the separatory funnel. Um, and so therefore, we take that, <clears throat> that uh, um, uh, a water phase and put it in, the, in that separatory funnel and also put in there in a, in a, uh, a um, uh, <clears throat> approximately uh, 200 milliliters of uh, methylene chloride. Um, and then in other words, we shake that, uh, then we shake up the, um, uh, take that separatory funnel, we put, you hold, put the stopper on the top of it and the stop cock, in other words, we close it of course and then we shake it up. Uh, and then we, in other words, we uh, 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 turn it upside down, open up the stop cock to let any gases out uh, and we do this several times and so forth. And then we put the separatory final back in, on, in, in this holder. Um, and then we wait until, in other words, you know, in other words, a clear line of demarcation. Now, methylene chloride is going to be on the, uh, the lower portion, uh, and the water phase is going to be on the upper portion. Uh, and these are two immiscible liquids, which means they do not mix. They're like oil and water. Um, and so, therefore, the, there's a line of de demarcation. So now what you do, you use the stopcock. To, in other words, uh, draw down the um, uh, the methylene chloride layer down to where the water starts going into the um, the water layer starts going into the stopcock, and you stop it there. So now down in that Erlenmeyer flask and uh, down beneath that, now you now have you now have methylene chloride with the caffeine. Um, but the um, the upper phase, in other words, is the is the aqueous phase, which which has all the solubles of coffee except for the caffeine. So now you take that, 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 that water phase, you put it in the beaker that we started with, and then you put it into the, um, uh, in, in, into the, uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, a new batch of uh, green beans that have the, have the caffeine in it. So you, you, you dumped a, a half, another half a pound of green beans into the, into the aqueous or water layer. Um, and therefore, the only thing that can come out of the green beans is of course the caffeine because there's no caffeine in the, uh, in the aqueous phase. But everything else cannot come out of the green beans uh, uh, because there's already an, equilib an equilibrium concentration of those, uh, those substances in that aqueous phase. So therefore, in other words, the, the, uh, the caffeine comes out into, the, into, the aqueous, into that aqueous phase and that decaffeinates the beans. So that's the general foods process for decaffeinating coffee. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, it's uh, where, in other words, uh, uh, you um, uh, carry out the decaffeination uh, to about 97% is decaffeinated. It takes uh, you know, several hours to do that. Uh, and so when you can see on the, the right-hand side of that, that slide, on the lower part is, is the, um, the molecule of, uh, of, caffeine, uh, of caffeine. You'll notice it, it's a nitrogen, in other words, uh, uh, a compound. Uh, that has uh, 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 the oxygen uh, uh, associated to the ring. Uh, so therefore, in other words, it's, um, uh, it's uh, it, it, that's what we're, what we're looking at. Now there's one other thing that I, I, I have to say, and that is the fact that uh, we have to go back to the, in other words, the uh, 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 extraction. Now in the bottom of the Erlenmeyer flask is a mixture of, uh, is a, is a solution now of caffeine and, and uh, 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 the um, um, methylene chloride. Now, in, in a, you, uh, by crystallization, you remove the, uh, the caffeine from that. And that, in other words, uh, so was that, that caffeine is then sold to um, uh, soda manufacturers. Uh, and and that's, uh, that, that, that's very important in the process because um, um, when you compare, in other words, um, uh, doing, uh, uh, doing regular coffee that's not decaffeinated with the caffeinated coffee, you can see this procedure I've described here. In other words, it's gonna be an expensive procedure, but fortunately, you have that caffeine to be able to sell to the soda manufacturers and that about equilibrates the price. So that when you go to the grocery store, the cost of decaffeinated coffee is about the same price as the price of regular roast and ground. That's not, the, not the decaffeinated. Um, so that's how, how General Foods decaffeinates their coffee. Um, 
You can see, for example, in other words, 12 cups of, uh, of regular coffee is, contains about 140 milligrams. Uh, the one uh, uh, thing about uh, the caffeination process, General Foods advertises, for example, that the, the beans never come in contact with the solvent. Now notice, for example, when I the process I described, in other words, that the, uh, uh, when I did the extraction, it was always on the green extract, on that extract solution. Uh, so therefore, in other words, uh, that, uh, that's basically the process. That, but unfortunately, some, some um, methylene chloride does get into the coffee. Uh, in, the, in the decaffeinated coffee, uh, about 100 uh, uh, ppms, or part per million of, um, of methylene chloride, gets into the coffee, an eight ounce, uh, in, in, in an eight, eight ounce cup of coffee. Uh, so uh, up to now, people don't think that, that, that it has any effect on them, and I guess not, uh, and uh, so forth like that. But there is some, some, uh, some uh, methylene chloride does get into the, uh, into the decaffeinated coffee. Of course, you don't have that in roasted ground coffee. Uh, that is not decaffeinated. <clears throat> okay, can we move on to the next slide? I need a little break here. I lost my... Okay, now the next, uh, in other words, uh, coffee I'm going to describe is instant coffee. Uh, instant coffee represents about 13% of the market for coffee. Um, the um, uh, <clears throat> and there are, and to do instant, uh, to make instant coffee, which you, you make a brew, same as you do at home, and then you remove the water. Okay, now there are two ways of removing the water. One is by spray drying, and the other is by um, uh, uh, by by freeze drying. Now, for, uh, spray drying is a relatively inexpensive process. And spray drying, what you do is, in other words, you um, uh, take some uh, uh, you, you have, you have a, a horizontal ve vessel, uh, and then, in other words, you, you uh, uh, pump hot air into, into the top of that vessel. And the, the hot air goes in at around 130 degrees centigrade, and it comes out of the bottom of, the, of, of, of that horizontal vessel uh, at about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, centigrade. Uh, then, in other words, you, uh, you, you atomize and spray the uh, liquid, co uh, liquid coffee that you have but into the, into the uh, top part of the vessel. And as it filters down through that, hot, uh, through that hot air that's there, in other words, it, it, uh, the moisture content, in other words, is, is evaporated. And when it gets down to the bottom, it, could, it reaches down, down the bottom as a solid. Uh, the, um, uh, so therefore, the, um, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a relatively simple way of making coffee, uh, of, of drying, drying coffee. And of course, in other words, uh, now there's just one other process that's involved here. Number one, you'll notice, for example, I said it was 130 degrees. Now 130 degrees centigrade is a high temperature for those aldehydes and ketones. Uh, so therefore, in other words, they take uh, roasted ground coffee, they press it, uh, and then they, in other words, they, uh, to get the oil out. Now the oil is where the, in other words, uh, in, that uh, in the coffee that's been roasted uh, that they're using. In other words, is so it uh, contains most of the aldehydes and ketones in that in that in that roasted coffee. So they take that oil and they spray it on the inside of the ca the cap of the coffee before they put it onto the. Co and then, they, then, they, then they then they close down the coffee uh, coffee and seal it. Uh, in that way, when the consumer buys the coffee, in other words, and they open it up and so forth, like that, they'll have, have a nice aroma of coffee coming off, uh, in other words, uh, and they'll, they'll uh, but we try to tell them that, in other words, put it back on as soon as you can so that the next time you use that cup of uh, that instant coffee, you will still have the aroma. Uh, the, um, the other thing is, that, in other words, that the other uh, way of make, making uh, coffee uh, instant coffee is with a freeze dryer. Uh, now, the freeze drying process is on the next slide. And uh, that, uh, now, uh, this you'll notice, for example, is the triple point diagram of, um, uh, of um, uh, water. So this is the water that's in the coffee, you know, and so forth like that. So therefore, in other words, the water that's, that's in, 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 in the coffee, that liquid, uh, coffee that you, you, you that you brewed that you brewed comes on in other words in in, in, in this water phase here at at around um, uh, a one atmosphere pressure 
uh, one atmosphere pressure and it was about 20 degrees centigrade in there. So therefore, when you close the freeze dryer up uh, with the coffee inside, uh, then in other words, you, you lower the temperature to, uh, and you, so you're moving to the left over here. Uh, and then that, that's the, uh, the crystallization line where the coffee is going to go from uh, the water in the coffee is going to go from a, from a liquid to a solid, solid ice. Uh, and you lower it down to minus 10 degrees centigrade. Uh, then, you know, the, then you, you lower the temperature, you know, lower the pressure down to, in other words, below the triple point pressure. Now, triple point pressure is 0 0.006 atmospheres. That's for water. In other words, so you lower it below that. So you're down into this region down here where I have my pen. And then in other words, then you, then you begin to heat it up, you're maintaining that pressure. And then as you move across here, you'll, you'll move across the sublimation line. That's where the ice goes from, uh, in other words, uh, it, uh, it transforms into water vapor, which is, some, is, is then pumped out of the system. You bring it all, all over here to it where it's 20 degrees centigrade. And then, when, when, and then if you open up the freeze dryer, voila, the, uh, uh, you have solid, solid coffee in all of the jars. Uh, now you can see this is a much more expensive process than the spray drying. Uh, it's the General Foods product called Maxim. Uh, yeah, the one that's spray dried is, is, is what it's called Instant Maxwell House. Um, so you can see, for example, they you know it's going to be a little bit more expensive. Uh, so the way you're processing it is compared to the spray drying. Uh, so that's how you do it. Those are the two methods of making instant, instant coffee. Um, uh, and, uh, and and you get them ready. So if you want to, if you if, if you drink instant coffee, you just put it into your into your, uh, the solids into your cup, and add the hot water, and you have your you and your coffee ready to go. Uh, I am not a, a, a user of instant instant coffee. Uh, whenever I drink coffee, I drink it in the morning, and I drink it in other uh, uh, regular roasting ground, um, and um, <clears throat> so forth. Now, the last part, the thing, in other words, uh, uh, method of making coffee is with a, a, a supercritical carbon dioxide. Now, if you take a look at uh, the, um, this lower diagram over here, in other words, uh, now carbon dioxide, it has a critical temperature of 31 degrees centigrade. Fortunately, that, that's a low temp temperature. Uh, and it has a critical pressure of 213 atmospheres. That's a high pressure. But in other words, if you want, in other words, get into the supercritical region, that's this yellow region right here. In other words, you've got to, you've got to be above the critical pressure and you've got to be you know, above the critical temperature to put it in this yellow region right here. I cut it off a little bit, but it does show you a little bit. That puts you into this region here. In that region here, in other words, the carbon dioxide gas has been converted to a liquid and liquids dissolve things. And in fact, uh, carbon dioxide has a special pro a propensity for caffeine. So, in the process, in other words, you put in, in other words the uh, the green beans in this in this container right here, and then you introduce carbon dioxide, and in other words, then you heat the uh, you heat this up above thirty one above thirty one degrees centigrade, uh, so that the, the the temperature inside here is about is above thirty one above the critical temperature, and you also in other words introduce carbon dioxide, and in other words until its pressure is in, in excess of two hundred and fifteen atmospheres. Uh, and then that, so that's a liquid, a liquid carbon dioxide that's in here. That's the supercritical. It goes through, it goes through those beans, decaffeinates them, and then, in other words, when the time has come to think, when that process is completed, you take it out over here. It goes through a pressure-reducing valve right here. As soon as you reduce the pressure, the carbon dioxide loses its sol solvating pow power for that caffeine. It drops out, in other words, and over here in the uh, in the in the collector. In other words, this is, this has water in it. Uh, so therefore, when the, when the caffeine comes over here, in other words, it, and, and it dissolves in the water. Now, then you drain it at the bottom, you have a mixture, you, you have a, a solution of, of, uh, of water and, uh, and, uh, and uh, caffeine. Now you can uh, separate them either by crystallization or the preferred method now is uh, reverse osmosis. Uh, then, the, the, then, the, then the caffeine that doesn't have the um, uh, uh, I mean, the carbon dioxide uh, that doesn't have the, uh, the caffeine in it anymore is pumped down through the system and used again for the second batch of uh, carbon dioxide. As, in other words, so as you pump it all the way through, uh, in other words, it, it, you, you get a nice in, uh, uh, decaffeination.
I've tasted the coffee from uh, the carbon dioxide. It's far superior to the, uh, uh, to the methylene chloride uh, uh, decaffeinated coffee. The, um, the other thing to keep in mind is the fact that when you look over here, in other words, you, you see this, I see this is carbon dioxide. So the solvent that's being used here is, is carbon dioxide. Uh, and in other words, the, uh, uh, and of course, you know, that's not methylene chloride uh, or anything else. Uh, the companies would like to go to this process too, in other words, for, uh, uh, to make coffee, but it is very expensive because of 215 uh, atmospheres of pressure. Uh, so um, it's, uh, in other words, uh, something that uh, uh, they've looked at, but uh, since methylene chloride works, they're gonna stick with it. Uh, the, um, So I'd just like to point out one other thing is the fact that uh, when I worked for General Foods Corporation in 1985, they were, the company was purchased by Philip Morris. Philip Morris owns the company today. Um, the, um, uh, and the price was $56 billion. The, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, at the time, General Foods stock was in the middle 50s uh, and the buyout price was $120. So that was a big, nice big deal. Uh, Warren Buffett claims that he made $300 million in a transaction. I hope all that some of you had some general food, general food stock at that time and did well. Uh, I personally know that didn't make as much money as Warren Buffett did, but I, I, I had some shares of stock and I, at that time my kids were thinking of going, going to college. And so therefore I was able to use the money that I, I got from my general food stock to pay a good portion of their college expenses as they both went to Midwestern schools. Uh, uh, my son went to Penn State, and my uh, and my uh, daughter went to Michigan State. Um, and um, now, uh, when my wife was still around, uh, we would go into the grocery store and look at you know, and I look for all these Jim Foods products. <laughs> and if you do, in other words, I mean, we're talking about the products we're talking about are products like, uh, in other words, uh, 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 <clears throat> Um, Jello, Max, Maxwell's coffee, all of the craft products, all of the post products, uh, in other words, all of the bird's eye products. I mean, these are all products that are now owned by Philip Morris. But if you go into the grocery store, you won't see Philip Morris on any of those cartons. Uh, because as you know, people would associate uh, the, um, uh, that from, uh, uh, <coughs> with, uh, with um, uh, tobacco. And you know, tobacco is a bad name in America. Uh, and so they have other people who probably may not buy some of these products if they knew that it was Philip Morris. So they don't put the, uh, uh, Philip Morris on any of the products that you buy, but they own it uh, and so forth like that. Uh, well, that completes my portion of the, uh, of the coffee report. Uh, the remainder of this talk will be given by Alan Hamilton on different ways to brew coffee. Uh, thanks, Al. That was a great uh, presentation. Um, Thank you. Do you guys remember being in high school and the teacher would tell you that you had a pop quiz? Uh, and it was a device to make you study and be prepared for the next day. So Al has prepared a 10 question pop quiz on the chemistry of decaffeination. So um, you need to go to your screen to put up yes and no. Uh, anybody who gets them all right gets their um, dues refunded. So let's see if I can find the first question. Oh, oh, I forgot the quiz. Well, I guess you guys are off the hook. But uh, this is a cartoon for reasons scientists drink coffee. So I'll have to ask the Bell Labs people if they can relate uh, to the reasons why they drink coffee. 75% uh, caffeine, 15% procrastination, alternative to eating and taste is 1%, uh, 9%. So that means that uh, scientists, of all the things that they relate to caffeine, 9% is taste. I don't know if that figures or what. Okay. Um, I, I will remind you later on, I'm going to ask a question. In fact, let me do it now. If you can bring up your screen, Paul, are you there? 
Yes, I'm here. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask a question. Can you briefly describe the yes and no? Right, okay, so first everybody has to have their participants list showing. And we, we've done this in most meetings. Just click the participants icon at the bottom of your screen or it'll be at the top if you're on an iPad. And that should pop up the participants list. At the lower left corner of the participants list is an icon of a blue hand, and you have to click that. Oh wait, you wanna do a yes or no or blue hands? Yeah, a yes only. Oh, okay, there's also an icon, a green icon at the bottom that's labeled yes. So click that at the appropriate time, and then we'll see a count. Okay, uh, well, I'll ask the question. You can click it, and then Paul will tell me when, they're, when we finish counting. So I need to find out how many people buy whole bean coffee. Uh, you buy whole bean coffee, and you either grind it at the retail market, or you grind it at home. So what I'm doing is trying to figure out how many serious coffee drinkers we have here. Uh, so you can go ahead and do that, and I'll continue with the uh, a couple of screens I've got here. So buying coffee, fresh, 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 whole bean, that's the way to go. For those of you who buy ground coffee, that's okay. For those of you who use the Kerrigs, that's okay. It's very convenient, but uh, whole bean is the best. Now, um, Buying fresh roasted coffee is the best. Um, Paul has told me that there's a um, coffee shop in Summit by this name. I'm, I'm going to say Airy. I'm sure he can correct my pronunciation here. Yeah, he calls himself R. R. Okay, uh, the two mm -hmm. R's. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. The other one I discovered online was Moon Cup in Jersey City. I don't know of that. I just picked it up online. So you can keep that in mind if you want to get some. We used to have an, one in Denville called Mara's, but they stopped roasting. Uh, I don't know what happened, but uh, I got it occasionally. It was, it was good. Now the next place uh, to get coffee is mail order because it tends to be fresh. My favorite is Pete's, but there are many uh, companies that you can mail order coffee from. Uh, the next choice would be retail whole bean. And uh, I would recommend Starbucks or the supermarket. The supermarket has a modest uh, selection of whole bean coffee. And then last is ground coffee, and I should have added Keurigs there too. Do we have a count yet on the whole bean people? Yes, we have 18 yeses and six noes. So that's only 24 total out of, a nine, out of 94. Yeah, that's fine. Um, that's okay because um, if you're not buying whole bean coffee, I'll describe to you how you can do that. This is the world's most expensive and unusual coffee. That little animal there in the upper left is a civet. It can be found in Southeast Asia, among other places. Uh, what happened was these civets were eating uh, the coffee beans in uh, the plantations and they were uh, pooping out the undigested coffee beans. Uh, someone somewhere along the line figured out that they wanted to use the coffee beans. They ground it up and uh, this is the world's most expensive coffee. A hundred grams is $119 and for all you non-metric people, I converted that to 3.5 ounces and that converts to $545 a pound. Now what they've done is they've, I guess they've caught these civets, they put them in cages, which that little guy is in, and fed them nothing but coffee beans. Oh, and you can get this on Amazon. Okay, coffee equipment. Um, grinders I'm gonna talk about, and I'm gonna talk about drip machines. 
Uh, coffee pour over is shown on the upper right there. Uh, that's good for a cup. You grind some beans, you put it in the plastic container and pour over the hot water. I have a French uh, press, which is shown in the lower image. You put the ground beans in there and you basically brew it for about four minutes and you use the plunger to separate uh, the coffee from the green uh, beans. Okay, coffee grinders. The one on the left is a manual grinder. Uh, you put it in the top and you turn the handle and uh, you get the ground coffee. I suppose if you wanted some exercise, that would be a good way to do it. Uh, another way to do it is a blade grinder. It's shown in the diagram in the upper section and to the right, it's a blade. Uh, you press it and it grinds up the coffee. Uh, you do have to use it correctly. Um, and if you're grinding coffee for the first time, it's okay. However, um, it is recommended that uh, you consider purchasing a burr grinder. Uh, in the upper diagram, you can see on the left, you can see the beans drop into the center of the grinding device, the burr grinder, grind it up and it drops out the bottom. Okay, coffee equipment drip. Um, these were recommended by America's Test Kitchen. They buy this stuff, they test it, they figure out what's best. Uh, the one on the right there is a Boniva. It's $149. It's a little pricey, but it gets the temperature right and it's highly recommended. You'll see that it comes with a insulated double walled um, stainless steel carafe, which helps keep the coffee warm. By the way, you don't have to brew a full pot of coffee to use all of these devices, you can brew two, four, six, or eight. Uh, the other one on the left, lower left, is a Hamilton Beach. That's $39, and both of these you can get on Amazon. The Hamilton Beach has a glass carafe, which is okay if you're drinking the coffee fairly quickly. After about 30 minutes, coffee tends to go off. Grinders. Uh, the two characteristics about grinders is, is that you're able to change the grind. So on each of these machines, uh, let me see. The one on the left, the grind setting is on top. You twist the container. The one on the left, the grind setting is the knob on the right side. And as you can see, uh, they both have a timer, which is helpful. Uh, depending on how much coffee you're brewing. Uh, both of these, uh, let's see, the Capresso was recommended by uh, Test Kitchen. Uh, I actually found the Burr coffee grinder in Amazon. Uh, if you're just starting out, uh, that's a very reasonable price for one of these. I think I talked Paul into it. He had a blade grinder and I showed him the price on the Burr grinder here and uh, he sounded like he was interested. I'm inclined, but could you tell us why it's better? Better than the blade? Yeah, what happens with the blade, let's go back to the blade. Okay, the blade grinder, you, you dump the beans in the top of the container for the blade grinder and it grinds it up and uh, the distribution of the grinding is, is, varies greatly from the correct grind that you want uh, to particle sizes that are larger and or smaller. With the burr grinder, uh, the grind is more predictable. So it drops through the top of the device and it grinds it to a narrower uh, distribution. And when you brew the coffee, you get a better result. Okay, ideal coffee, um, fresh roasted, 
For those of you in Summit, I think you have an easy destination there. Um, whole bean coffee um, at any place, uh, Starbucks, uh, coffee shop, uh, anywhere you can get whole bean. Uh, grind your coffee in a burr grinder if you can. Um, and then after you grind the coffee, um, fairly soon after you grind it, if not immediately, brew it. The ideal coffee brewing temperature is 200 degrees. Uh, so Al, are you there? Yes, I am. So the tell me about the two, 200 degrees. Well, the, the thing is with the uh, coffee, in other words, if you go to 212 degrees, in other words, which is the boiling point of water, in other words, it will also, in other words, uh, the, the coffee oils will, will, uh, will be soluble in the, and in, 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 that'll, that'll appear in your coffee. So if you only go up to 200 degrees, in other words, uh, you, those coffee oils are not soluble in, in the water. And so therefore, in other words, uh, you know, they, they don't appear in your coffee. So it's better to raise the temperature just to 200 degrees. In the old days, they had a, a coffee thing called Chemex. Uh, and that was just a funnel where you put uh, the, the, the paper in it, in other words, and then you, you, uh, you put your beans, uh, you, put your, you ground up coffee in the bottom of that funnel, that paper funnel. Uh, and then you pour the, uh, the boiling water over it. The idea being is that, like that in the process, in other words, the, the, the temperature drops down below 200 degrees. Uh, so therefore, you, know, you don't get the coffee oil. All right, good, thanks. Ideal coffee brewing time, four to six minutes. I actually have a timer on my coffee when I do drip coffee. And uh, most of the time the coffee uh, hits the time. Occasionally uh, the grind, uh, depending on the type of bean you buy, it, uh, it varies. So uh, you may wanna take a, a glance at the brewing time. But listen, if you're grinding coffee and you're drip uh, using the drip machine, it's gotta be good. Okay, this is a far side. Um, uh, the far side stopped about 15 or 20 years ago. Actually, Gary Larson, I think his name is, he is back doing illustrations. So this is an illustration of hell. So we have the devils, there's three of them. And then there's a guy at the bottom that says, oh man, the coffee's cold. They thought of everything. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Um, do we have the host helping with the questions? Let me ask the first question, uh, if I may. Al, you mentioned that um, many of the coffee companies keep a stock um, uh, a stockpile of coffee. Did I hear right that they keep 10 years supply of coffee beans? Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> that's right. The Jenna Foods, uh, uh, plant, uh, uh, it, it's a cave in, uh, in, in Iowa. Right. Uh, they, they, they air conditioned it. And the, uh, the green, uh, they, they obviously store the green beans because they're stable. Uh, and uh, so the idea being is, uh, in other words, um, not so much to replace, in other words, uh, in other words, they would get uh, Brazil or, or, or any of that. But if Brazil and those com uh, companies should run into a year where they get, uh, where they get, you know, the coffee plants get diseases, they still would be able to, in other words, uh, be able to provide coffee. Uh, so that's really the reason for that is primarily, in other words, to um, uh, keep uh, um, it, it, it available so that, in other words, if uh, the, the coffee industry is, is confronted with the diseases of the coffee of the right. coffee trees, that they still would be able to provide coffee. Thanks. Brett Honnold. Yes, excellent presentation. Thank you for uh, one of our favorite pastimes. Mm. Uh, it, a two-part question. One is, I was a bit astounded that the U.S. is number 25 versus Finland number one, given the predominance of coffee shops. Uh, Starbucks nation seems to be every other corner. So if you could expound on that a little bit about what, what's going on in Finland, number one. Second part of the question is this. If you think of other commodities, think of the world of oil, think of the world of wine, 
uh, they are renowned for in different parts of the world having different levels of quality. Do coffee beans have different levels of quality or taste based on whether they're from Brazil, Colombia, Ethiopia? You know, is, is that why uh, Brazil is number one or is it just they, they grow a lot? So th those are the two parts, the, the Finland and then uh, the quality of the beans from different parts of the world. Alan, Al, any answers? We seem to have lost him for a second. His tile is still here and he's not muted. Al, are you there? Al Glatz? Well, let me say that I've been to Scandinavia, including Norway, Sweden, and Finland, and they drink a lot of coffee. Uh, it's everywhere, every meal, multiple times of the day. So I, I hadn't realized that they uh, consumed uh, quite a bit more than everyone else. Let me offer a theory. Finland is very far north. In the winter, you need all that co coffee to stay awake when it's dark. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. think they're also renowned for alcohol on the other side when you get <laughs> that part right. of the world. So they obviously uh, need a lot to keep them awake and going. Yeah. Now the quality question, um, I can answer in part. Uh, the big thing about uh, coffee is the single source coffee. Single countries produce coffees in particular characteristics, just like wine. And then they're even getting to the point where they're marketing coffee from single plantations. Uh, so Central America, Ethiopia, uh, Brazil, I didn't rec Brazil, I think, is a quantity coffee producer. Although, uh, see, I, I subscribe to Pete's, so I buy a variety of coffees, and occasionally I'll see Brazil. Uh, I'll see Colombian a lot. I'll see Ethiopia. So that's the partial answer to the coffee quality question. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Hewitt. Jim Hewitt, you can, you can speak. His hand is up. Okay, so. Um, who's that? Mike Schneider? No, I guess he's got a radio playing or something. How about Bill Tittle? Okay, so I have a technical question for Al. Al, are you there? No, he's off the call. Now. Al. Okay, so I uh, then I don't have a question. Well, well, we'll leave you on the blue hand list until he shows up again. Maybe he'll dial in again. I'm glad I didn't have to answer a chemistry question. <laughs> okay, George Cole, if you unmute yourself, you're next. Yeah, well, this is a little chemistry, but it's also uh, for the general people, public. Uh, what about cold brew coffee, which has all of a sudden become very popular, where you fill up your, uh, your water and uh, in the center, you fill it up with the ground coffee, and then you throw it in the refrigerator, and then in 12 to 24 hours, you have concentrated coffee to drink. Has anybody tried that? I can only volunteer that I've had iced coffee in various locations like uh, Costco and Chick-fil-A and it's a very refreshing drink, but I think it comes from a coffee syrup concentrate. It isn't cold brew. Uh, Starbucks might be a, a potential destination to try a cold brew. Yeah, I was just interested if anybody found any difference between the two. Sounds like a good, another marketing twist. <laughs> yep. I would expect there would be some differences because the uh, higher temperature would cause uh, more chemicals to dissolve out of the coffee, right? Yeah. You, you yeah. Would but you get a different flavor profile 
because uh, every temperature extracts different uh, different chemicals. Yeah, exactly. The key thing about cold brew, as he pointed out, is that it sits in the refrigerator or on the counter for 12 to 24 hours. So we'll have to try that experiment and somebody can report back. <laughs> okay, That's George, good. you're on. I'll volunteer. <laughs> okay. I have a cold brew that my daughter got. <laughs> oh, good. Hey, now I have a question. Um, so obviously uh, it's smart to buy beans and grind them and you're gonna get much better coffee. Right. But is it smart to buy green beans and roast them yourself? Will you get better coffee? Uh, you can. I briefly looked into it. Uh, there are small countertop roasters and there are mail order sources for green beans. And, and uh, I remember, and you could probably get the green beans at the shops that do their own roasting. Al is back. Yeah, I'm back. I, I get cut off here. Okay, welcome back. So we had a question for you. Bill Tittle had a question for you. Bill, uh, unmute and ask. Okay. Yeah, Al, um, just to review the decaffeination process. So you first extract uh, the hundreds of chemicals out into an aqueous phase, and then you, uh, uh, and then you use the methylene chloride. But um, on, on, the, on, on that extract? Yeah. Um, uh, to, to get the, um, to get, to get the caffeine out of the extract, but you're not, you, you're using, aren't you going to be using the roast the green beans? You, no. you don't care about the extract. Um, no, we don't care about the extract at all. We just use it in other words to extract the caffeine. Yeah. And, and you, and, and you're doing the methylene chloride only because you want to recover methylene chloride for the economic value of it. Yeah, well, the, the caffeine we want to ca recover. Yeah, because we can sell just out to throw the, the whole aqueous phase away. Yeah, so, well, I mean, you know, the words, general foods, in other words, they, uh, as far as the uh, that, a that aqueous phase, which is uh, which we call green extract. In other words, it continues to it continues to evaporate in the process, uh, mm -hmm. and so we just continue to add to it. I mean, general foods has not added has, hasn't hasn't uh, yeah, changed the uh, the green extract for years. You know. Okay, so. thank you. Jim, Jim Hewitt, are you there? No, he hasn't come back. So, uh, let's hey, Al, see. we had a question about home roasting. Do you have any opinions on it? Uh, no, but I can tell you one thing. In other words, you know that uh, device, uh, uh, do, do you make a, a popcorn in a, in a, in a, in a, one of those uh, heated things? In other words, uh, yes. in other words, well, you can roast coffee in there. Oh, that's true. <laughs> I have yeah, a but, book on coffee, and you can do it in a pan on the on the stovetop. Sure, yeah. but but the temperature is critical. So you know, I that's suppose right. a, a roaster is going to control that, and you wouldn't have to yes. think too hard about it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So Herb Waddell, you can unmute and ask. Herb. Oh, here he is. Go. Go for it, Herb. Herb, you were unmuted and now you're muted again. No, you can talk, Herb. You're unmuted. No, you got muted again. <laughs> Please click it just once. I see his picture. I know. Yeah. I sent you another unmute request. <clears throat> Herb, I'll send you one more. Okay, Herb, we're going to defer you, and you can keep trying to unmute. But meanwhile, we're going to go to Roger Burns. Unmute and talk. There you go. Okay, uh, I have a question. Uh, if you buy, uh, let's say, a, a pound or two of ground coffee in a can or whatever, is it wise to uh, freeze it, keep it in the freezer, or is that, is that harmful? No, it's definitely not harmful. I mean, uh, you know, definitely not. The colder you can keep it, the better off you are because those oh. aldehydes and ketones, in other words, will, will, will de de uh, tend to decompose. 
All right. A second, since that was so quick, uh, I uh, years ago we went to Hawaii, my wife and I, and while we were there, I, I had uh, Kona coffee, and I thought it was really great. And uh, I'd been buying it. In fact, in the whole bean, I have a machine that grinds and makes the coffee all in one. Um, but it's. Uh, do you have a, a feeling of uh, an opinion on Kona coffee from Hawaii? It's not. It's not cheap, and it's a little hard to find. I found it in Wegmans in bean only. Uh, but otherwise, I haven't seen it anywhere else. Uh, my my perception is that it's. I, I like a, a mild coffee, uh, so the, the Kona coffee is a little too strong for me. Oh really? Oh okay. Well, thank you. That's mm -hmm. it. Appreciate it. Hey, I'm unmuted now. Yeah. Oh, well, let me finally. add to the question about storage. Um, the key thing about coffee is having it fresh. So. Um, Buy only what you need. Ah. If it's on sale and you it sits there for two months, uh, that's not good. Mm. Uh, the freezing question <clears throat> is a toss up. And um, it comes in a bag with a valve on it that releases the CO2. Right. So that's helpful. And then I've bought Kona as well and some other super premium uh, coffees. And my conclusion was for my taste, I didn't think it was worth four to five times the cost of the coffee. But if you buy it and you like it, that's fine. Maybe it's a bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> I got a super hey, premium. Brand. Yeah. Uh, somehow I got unmuted. All right. Uh, Go ahead. <laughs> All this talk about fresh coffee is fine, but you might be getting 10-year-old beans unless you arrange to buy direct from the farm. I'd like your opinion on this baby. How does this rate in your scale of grinders? This was my mother-in-law's in which she ground eight o'clock coffee beans. Oh yeah. Well, many, many decades. I can't see it, but is it the one with a handle? Yeah. Yeah. You, well, you can't see my picture. Well, I have my diagram up, uh, the pr presentation. I know which oh. one you mean, and grinding any coffee is fine. When I first started getting enthusiastic about coffee, eight o'clock coffee was, was what I bought. I had to go to the A&P store, right? That was- yep, That's right. To get it. <laughs> and I guess A&P uh, carried on with this ground coffee business for quite a while. Good well, anyway, you. you can still buy beans there, but you can't buy a grinder like this. It's cast <laughs> iron and wood. Herb, I have a question or two about that grinder, Herb. Yeah. Do you, do you use it yourself or have you used it? No, but I'm tempted. I think my, maybe I will. Okay, so here's, I'd like you to use that and report back because I got a little one thinking, you know, I want to, let's, why not be a purist and not use electricity? And I would have to grind that forever to get enough for one cup of coffee. I quickly abandoned it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, but, the, but yours is bigger. Is, yours is bigger. I, maybe that's the that's the answer. You know, a serious one um, maybe grinds it fast enough that you would do it. And I also want to reply to something that uh, Paul said about coffee keeping people awake. If you drink a lot of coffee, it doesn't bother you. <laughs> if you drink a one six ounce cup a day, and if you drink it at eight o'clock at night, you're up all night. But if you drink eight cups a day, you can drink till nine o'clock at night and go right to sleep. I agree. <laughs> so my advice is drink more coffee and it won't bother you. <laughs> well, okay, so there's a question. Does coffee have any long-term health effects apart from keeping you awake? Ooh. Well, I can tell you, my, I can tell you from myself, for myself, I happen to have, I happen to have, happen to have a heart condition. Um, and the um, uh, thing about it is the fact that uh, if I take uh, uh, the, uh, get up in the morning and, uh, and uh, um, uh, drink my car uh, and, and take my blood pressure, and then another an hour later, after I have my after I've had my coffee, if I take my blood pressure again, it is always lower. When, in other words, before in, in the morning before I have my coffee, so 
as far as I am concerned, in other words, it, it, it affects the blood pressure. It's, it's not a big change, but, it, but it's there. Okay, uh, Jim Blinn, your turn, if you unmute. Yes, I, when you started talking about coffee, I started thinking about Alexa Hante. Uh, does uh, that ring a bell with some of you? No, explain. Um, coffee commercials. Yes. Uh, they, um, he used to, to uh, I don't remember which one he, he advertised. <laughs> I just remember the name and he was uh, like a Mexican or Southern South America. Okay. So the other uh, Maxwell House always had the, uh, had lots of good coffee commercials too. Oh yeah. The one I remember was they, uh, they would say, uh, wake up and smell the coffee. Now, yeah. now I realize that for everybody to get that experience, you'd have to walk around the house with the coffee can open. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I worked in Colombia for three years, and the routine with Colombia was that they uh, used very strong coffee. Uh, the girls would come around uh, periodically, and you'd get an ounce of ink black coffee, not espresso, but coffee brewed uh, with very strongly. And they took these little black cups and I scarfed it down and that was the coffee break. Okay, Bill Afrazisi, sorry if I mispronounce your name, but go. Thanks for taking me. Uh, yeah, I'm right. Half, we moved out here. We're in the uh, Pacific Northwest in Woodenville, not far from Seattle. So there's a lot of coffee action out here. But a couple of comments. Number one, Al, thanks very much for reminding me about Maxwell House. Uh, we went to school in Hoboken at Stevens in, in the 60s. And of course, the aroma of the roasting was one of the things that was a signature of that campus. So we didn't always have to go for coffee. We had the aroma. So <laughs> yes, that's, right. that's good. <laughs> so, that I, hope it, I hope it encourage you to buy, buy the coffee though. Right. right. Uh, the other thing is uh, there was a question about cold brew. I've done it myself at home here and it's fine. It, I found it very mild even for uh, dark roasted, but it's very labor intensive to properly uh, filter the uh, ground beans out and have it. So it's, a, it's kind of a, a, a working thing. It's, it's much more difficult than, let's say, the old day of doing sun tea, if you remember, a couple of tea mm -hmm. bags and water. It's much yeah. more difficult because your, your coffee is uh, evenly distributed throughout the, the water. So, and uh, is the brand that we were thinking of for Alexa Hente, Uban? I remember that as a coffee well, brand. Well, yeah, Uban is, a, is, a, is an all, com uh, is an all co Colombian coffee. Right. So again, thanks very much, Al. It was an excellent tour. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, I Alan? Alan? Yes? Um, you mentioned about buying, uh, buying beans. In other words, when, uh, uh, before I got my Keurig and my wife was still alive, we used to buy beans, but we bought our beans from Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah. It's a very uh, popular brand. And you, you, you could, as I, I just wanted to point out, you could buy the beans there also. Ivan. Yes. First of all, I'd like to confess that for years I was an instant coffee drinker, but since I got my Keurig, it's changed my world. <laughs> and that, I used to have to use, you know, half and half or creamer in the instant coffee, but now with the Keurig, I don't want to adulterate the coffee, so I'm an unadulterator. And I feel if you put cream in a coffee, you are, you're adulterating it and ruining the taste. So you drink yes. black, black coffee? Ivan. Way to go. Also, um, it's taught in our, um, in our surgical classes in ophthalmology to not drink caffeinated coffee, that you might get a micro tremor under a microscope. Oh. I didn't have that problem. In fact, I felt better using a microscope with coffee than without coffee. So coffee didn't affect me. As a matter of fact, even when I have coffee at nighttime, I have no trouble sleeping. So that's yeah. my comments. Now, Ivan, if you want to go to advanced Keurig, you can buy a grinder that automatically grinds the coffee into a reusable K 
Keurig uh, device that you wash out. And I so I just like the, the single use ones. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'm lazy. It's okay. Yeah. The advantage of the Keurig is 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 the convenience. Oh yeah. And the temperature. The temperature is yeah. perfect. Also. Yeah. I I'll tell you. I had a Keurig for a while, and I my wife liked the. Uh, the throwaway ones, you know, the official ones that Curry makes money from. But I like to, I, I used the refillable ones because I wanted to have other brands of coffee. And Curry uh, tried very hard to prevent people from using refillable ones. And what they did was they put some, um, uh, some special ink in the uh, label on the top of the little canister that would be picked up by an ultraviolet light in the machine. And it would refuse to work if it didn't find that. <laughs> and, then, and then there was a whole bunch of people online that were finding ways to defeat that <laughs> system. And I tried them all. And finally, the thing broke and I threw it out. And then I got a Hamilton Beach, not like the one you showed, but it's one that actually lets me use Keurig devices or refillable Keurig devices or simply a little uh, plastic cone with coffee grounds in it. So uh -huh. I can do anything with my Hamilton Beach. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so the next person is Ted Bassman. Go. Yeah. Um, I used to drink uh, a caffeinated coffee by the uh, bucket when I was a software developer. And this doesn't have to do with going to uh, sleep at night. The weekends would hit and I would get a caffeine withdrawal uh, hangover. Like I had uh, a <laughs> it on on a uh, Friday night and actually hadn't anything alcohol, ac alcoholic at all. So I really had to cut down on the uh, caffeine. Uh, the other one is that I find uh, the Kona uh, coffee in the, uh, the curing type things, and I buy them at Fort Dix, and they were a pretty reasonable uh, price. Now, granted, I retired from uh, the military, and I'm able to uh, do that, but yeah, it's out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so at this point, uh, let me interrupt for a moment and say that we've actually passed 1130. Uh, we have still have a half a dozen blue hands up. So if, if the presenters are willing, we can go for a few more minutes. Mm. If you have to leave, you can leave. Let's go. Mm -hmm. So the next person is uh, Bappi. That is. Am I on mute? Yes, you are. Go ahead. You're on. Dead. There's two schools. One says that you take Starbucks coffee and one says Dunkin' Donut coffee. And people who like Dunkin' Donut coffee don't like Starbucks coffee. And Starbucks coffee drinker does not like Dunkin' Donut. Do you know why that is? Well, I myself, Papi, in other words, I myself do not like strong coffee. Uh, so therefore, that's why I do not like Starbucks coffee, but I like Dunkin' Donuts coffee. But is there anything in the chemicals and things like that that? No, not that I'm not that I'm aware of. Chemistry, okay. Starbucks well, like, and the I'd other like to make manufacturers a about that. have recognized that uh, they need to supply a variety of coffee roasts. So Starbucks actually has a medium roast that they sell. Oh. Yeah. But hmm. Starbucks do something else. It's called marketing. And they have turned coffee drinking in their lounges into a whole experience. <laughs> I wouldn't call going into, into Dunkin' Donuts and buying a cup of takeout as an experience. So that's a very big part of it. Is that right? Don't you think? Ambience. My daughter lives in LA and Starbucks has opened up a number of super premium coffee shops where they do a pour over cup of coffee for something on the order of $8. <laughs> so my son-in-law uh, had a freebie. He went in there, tried it, and uh, that was the last time he was there. He doesn't want to spend eight bucks for a cup of coffee. <laughs> so Walter, you're up next. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Jim Blinn was asking about who did the Alexa Hente coffee commercial and for what coffee. I looked it up, but I posted it in the chat area. It was Savern Coffee. I put the YouTube link to it. So if anybody wants to reminisce there. Um, 
The other thing is um, I've taken a liking to Turkish coffee. And it's kind of an interesting coffee because they grind it until it's its finest talc powder. So if you sneeze, it's like all over the place. And and what you do is you have this special copper pot called the chesve, and you simmer it under very low heat until it just pearls and sort of forms bubbles. And when it's ready, you pour it into two, like in two stages into small demitasse cups. And um, usually you put a little bit of sugar in when you brew it so it's not too bitter. But it's actually very good. I don't know how many people have tried it. But yeah, uh, I've tried it. I mean, it, it turns out that when uh, my wife and I got married, uh, across the street from her was an Armenian family. Oh, and they yeah. made, in other words, Turkish coffee. Uh, number one, it's, it's, it, 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 it's done in those demitasse cups and everything like that. But in other words, it's very thick. In fact, in other words, if you put the spoon in the center of the, of the coffee, it stays there. It doesn't move to the side of the cup. I mean, it's, it's a very, very thick coffee, uh, and, you, uh, and, uh, and you need the sugar. <laughs> yeah, you, you need the sugar, but also the, the grounds just sort of settle on the bottom, and yeah. you drink it down to the mud, and then you stop. Yeah. <laughs> now, Walter, you qualify for the advanced coffee degree. Now, another version of that, except with a, a little different style, is Cuban coffee. Uh, it's done uh, a similar way, but not with super ground coffee. I think it's done with uh, moderately fine coffee. It's done in a kitchen, and it's boiled uh, and reboiled and then poured into a cup. I grew up in Miami, so I've had that a couple of times. My cats. Yes, does uh, anybody use percolators anymore? We'll hear about his drip coffee. <clears throat> I don't know of any technical reason or quality reason why you'd want to use a percolator or a vacuum type of uh, device. Remember the vacuum device? Oh, yeah, the Silex? Oh, yeah. The water came up, you pull yeah, it off, right. and it came down. Oh, yeah, the Silex. Tom Ruggiero, you had your hand up, and now it's not up. If you're still on. Um, uh, maybe not. Are you? Yes, you're still there. Could you? Uh, and, unmute. And okay, Tom, now, I'm, now, Tom, I'm now I'm unmuted. Yeah, but I have uh, a second. I have a question for you before you start. What okay. were those goggles you were wearing before? Uh, those are magnifiers. Ah. I'm, I'm coming to you from my shop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But anyway, I, I just, just, just a quick factoid that I wanted. I, I, I went to a presentation, uh, a virtual presentation three weeks ago, and just an interesting thing about Starbucks. Um, do you know who Starbucks is? No. Actually, actually, the name Starbucks, where it came from, is the founder of Starbucks was a big fan of Herman Melville and Moby Dick. <laughs> and and he wanted to name the company Pequod, which is the ship in the Moby Dick uh, novel. And his marketing people convinced him that a boutique coffee shop with P in the name would not be palatable. So he decided he wanted what to call it, what to call it. So he named it Starbuck. Starbuck is the first mate on the Pequod. <laughs> And the and the uh, the uh, person on the Starbuck logo, that's the figurehead from the Pequod. All right, right. Well, I have a little bit of history to add to that. I've been to Starbucks number one in Seattle, um, so that was interesting. But um, the reason why I buy Pete's Coffee is because they're a coffee company. Uh, Starbucks is a company. A business. Now they do fine with coffee, but Pete's is serious. The founder of of Pete's, the name escapes me, uh, helped the original Starbucks founders put together their business. The original Starbucks founders were forced out by the present group. So, but mm -hmm. uh, they all supply a good product, though. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's it. So, Alan, do you want to do the closing ceremony? 
Yeah, let me see if I can get out of here. Oh, here we go. And find the certificate. I have to. Well, no, I, I have the certificate. Oh, you do? Okay, please. Go. Okay, Al, as you know, uh, we give this certificate uh, to all of our guest speakers. For any guests who are on, uh, the orchid shown in the lower left corner uh, displays is a symbol of um, a summit. At one time was the orchid capital of the US. And that's, mm -hmm. we, that's why we adopt it as our symbol. Uh, I don't think it came from any novels, but uh, it represents something that was grown in some. So uh, do you want to um, unmute everybody? We'll give them the salute. Uh, okay, so on behalf of the Summit Old Guard, thank you. <laughs>